24 word code of ethics for all employees to follow in their business and professional lives. The four way test was adopted by Rotary in 1943. It's a nonpartisan and non sectarian ethical guide for Rotarians to use in their personal and professional relationships. The test has been translated into 100 languages. Before we recite it today in English, Christina is going to say it for us in Spanish. La prueba de las cuatro vías es la verdad. Segundo, es justo para todas las preocupaciones. Tercero, edificará buena voluntad y mejores amistades. Y cuatro, será beneficioso para todas las preocupaciones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, and now in English. First, this is the truth. Second, it is fair to all concerned. Third, love build goodwill and better friendships. And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you Christina, for bringing a little international flavor to our meetings today.
trying to draw the list, pull up the list on my phone of the items that the Rotary Club Foundation is selling. Uh, one is a photo session with Mr. Fab, $250 value, and I looked last night and it's at $150, so there's still a lot of room to spend there. It's more than enough to Yeah, I think it went up. Nice. <laughs> um, we have uh, two Rotary labeled cornhole boards, 
provided by Art Sign, so it's professional, looks terrific. We have a membership to the YMCA for three months, and we have uh, $100 of gift cards for the orchards. So that's what we have. And if you go to Gateway Auction website, uh, you can go and bid now, and then tonight you can participate live through the website if you can't come out. So do that. <coughs> Great, thank you. So lots of options for tonight. And um, the woman on the other side of the camera today <laughs> is Steph. And Steph's going to talk to us a little bit about stroke prevention. Okay, thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, today, after immediately following the meeting, anyone and everyone is welcome to join me on the other side of these doors for some short prevention. Uh, very excited that the, we'll say, family member of strike prevention is here with us today. Um, so please join us for a tasty beverage if you choose. If you do not choose, come for some fellowship and get to know one another better. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing everyone who can join us and uh, hear what Dennis has words. to say. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Prevention Club in 2013. We had had a physician come to the club to make a presentation, and of the various things he said, one small part was that the moderate consumption of alcohol should prevent strokes. So we started the club, and we had four founding members, and these were the certificates that each founding member got. And uh, we were a bunch of old guys, retired guys for the most part, but we would get some other people now and then. And then in 2017-18, uh, the district, the Rotary District, awarded us this fellowship award. We won the fellowship award because of our school prevention uh, club. So it was, a, it was a nice thing for a while. We had anywhere from four to 15 people, but it's sort of fallen into uh, disuse lately, so hopefully we can get it going again. Looking nice. like forward to it. And uh, now, without further ado, I am pleased to present our speaker for today. Oh, we have a game. Oh, I forgot the game. Oh, I forgot the games. Okay. Don't forget the game. Help me out with the games. We also have happy, dollars. happy dollars. Okay. Let's we got some work to do. Happy dollars. Happy dollars. Anybody want to help Sue out to build the product today?
pot today. On the board, there is still $20 and the jackpot and a draw again up there. Do you want to pull the ticket? Sure. Very good. Last four. Eight, six, one, eight. Eight, six, one, eight. Marcos, come on up here. I was going to say, I had one in the pot, too. All right, there are 12 tickets on the board. I, last time this one was taken, the time before that, I pulled them all off so you can see the jackpot's still up there. Oh, all right. Empty pockets. Right, Try again. All right, now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker for the day. So we're really pleased to have joining us. Um, I'm gonna make sure I get my eyes are failing. Matthew Wed from the Tonka Jig Institute. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you. I have done Zoom meetings. I have done in-person meetings. This is my first time doing both. So we're going to test it with myself to walk, talk, and move two arms at the same time. Uh, cool dookie. All right, so thank you again for having me. Uh, as you said, I am Matthew Ware, the Executive Director of the Conica Jig Institute. And I'm here today both to meet new community members, but also to thank you. Uh, as most of you should be aware, we recently received grant funding from you guys for the Rotary Club Jig First Foundation. So we're really excited to talk about that as well. Before I talk about the grant, I'd like to know, show of hands, who has been to the Conscious Dig Institute uh, outside of Mercersburg, near the Maryland line? So, less than all of you, <laughs> no, <laughs> we are bad. Um, we are in a massive stage of growth, which I'll talk about, uh, and so hopefully by the end of the year, maybe by the end of next month, you'll all put your hands up, because uh, we are growing exponentially. To sum the content you get to up in a nutshell, there are leaflets on the table, and we'll email you guys leaflets. It is a hands-on regional learning centre. Uh, not a historical society, not a state park or a non-profit organisation, but hands-on regional learning. We have a very long mission to educate and preserve the cultural and natural resources of the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia frontier. <laughs> it's very long. We focus on the early 18th century frontier. Where we are, in Franklin County, just west of Mercerburg, was one of the earliest land settlements in the 1730s by Philip Davis and the name of John David Richards. So rather than focusing on war, the French and New World Revolution, which is popular, we focus on life. How do people live on the frontier? How do they put their shoes off? What do they eat? What things do they grow? And that focus on civilian life allows us to tell the whole American story rather than just a, a glory pass. If you look at the leaflets, the front says, discover a rural 18th century homestead that is surrounded by stunning natural environments. We have several 18th and 19th century log structures now built on our sites that have been relocated or reformed or sometimes rebuilt. And those provide windows into the cultural resources, how do people live. We're at 30 acre sites and we have a wetlands area, we have a woodlot, we have several meadows, pollinated gardens, community gardens, vegetables, and more. And so cultural and natural resources are represented in that mindset. In the past, CI yeah, focused solely on its history, but we're putting more focus now than ever before on our natural resources, improving our trails, here too, uh, because during COVID, people couldn't go inside buildings, we said, let's make our trails open. Let's put interpretive panels around those trails, and even when we're not doing a program, people can still enjoy it. Uh, Bartlett Services are here today. Uh, they were one of the first people I contracted with when taking over CI. We had a big 200-year-old tree that was in very close shape of falling on our Pine Egg Cemetery, on our trail. Not good. So trail maintenance, big part of it, and they brought it down perfectly. Uh, so we can talk a lot about the history, the programs we do at CI, but I've been told I have five to 10 minutes. Uh, so before we come on to the grant stuff, I just want to sum up a few of the exciting things we're doing right now. Like I said, we're in a stage of growth. We have more community sponsors, more funding right now than we've had in years prior. CI's been around since the 1990s. 
but it's never been in this fiscal stability to say, we're going to offer these programs and events for the next two years and keep going strong. There were times in the past when CI would have trouble getting enough education, enough school bookings in for our year. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we had more homeschool bookings in the last year than in the five years before it combined. I should add, I took over two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> more and more people are doing homeschooling because of COVID, but I'm really excited. Now the school networks are finally reaching out to us. Philip, I'm gonna miss your birthday on the 23rd, unfortunately. Uh, on that day, we're taking our programs into the school district. We're going to Greencastle Action Middle School, and for eight hours, I'm teaching 18th century surgery and medicine. <laughs> again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So we talk about a lot of amputations, a lot of vomiting, a lot, a lot of uh, enemas. For the kids, that way of doing history, it's science, it's gross, but it's also fun, it makes it entertaining for them. And for us, we know we're telling our history and our story. Um, so that's a big part of what we do at CI, is making history engaging making our natural resources engaging. We're partners with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, planted hundreds of trees over the last few years to repair the riparian stream buffer. But by planting a tree with a child, sure, I can plant 10 trees much faster. But by hosting our tree plantings for children and helping them do it, they can learn to respect the environment. They can learn that planting a tree makes a difference, and hopefully it might spark and become a forester or a historian or a museum director, uh, like me. Uh, so making our programs engaging is a big part of what we're doing and part of our success. We are a nonprofit. We are largely supported by members and donations. Our tours, our gift shop revenue, wouldn't pay a fifth of our budget. Uh, but we're very glad to have some very strong founding members. And last year we launched matching campaigns for the first time in CI's history that our matching campaigns and our membership in total outrivaled our main kind of founding donors who donate $40,000, $50,000 a year. Uh, so it was an amazing sign of success, and we're hoping to beat it this year. I did a letter campaign at Christmas. It made $30,000. It cost me $300 worth of stamps. <laughs> so I think that was a reward to show a great year of programming and outreach to the community, and members want to repay that back. So what have we got going up this year? We continue to do programming every week. Every Saturday you can visit CI and see costumed interpreters doing hands-on history as we call it. Dressing in the clothes of the 18th century, gardening, cooking. And if you visit, whether you're a child or you're a senior, you can try planting a row of turnips yourself. Try starting a fire, write with a quill, a ink. So we're doing that every Saturday. Our grounds are open daily dawn to dusk. And this year, finally, when you have in front of you, we have our event calendar set up for the year. So we've got some of the normal events. We have a big bonfire night for Guy Fawkes Day. The Guy Fawkes fans around here. No, it's a tradition that's largely been obliterated in America after the revolution, George Washington banned it. But before the revolution, it was one of the biggest public holidays in North America and it's still the biggest public holiday in Britain, and I'm British. So I figured, <laughs> combine that with what we do with our history, we have a nice niche event that people haven't heard of. Last year we had a bonfire the size of the building. We had about 250 people around it, it was pretty special. For July 4th weekend, which is July 2nd, I believe, this year, we're having our militia muster. It's the one time of year that we actually do military. Uh, on site, we're very lucky we have an ordinary or a tavern, or a public house. So we have a homestead, we have a bake we have a garden, and then we have a tavern. And so militias in the 18th century would muster at taverns. So that's tying in our resources with that themed weekend of American independence and making it into an event that people want to come out to. Uh, Gear House are going to be making for one of our pool events, our September 17th fundraiser, an historic recipe ale. Right here, the entire setup is going to be taken up for an entire day of brewing to make one of the recipes in George Washington's uh, uh, books. And they're going to be serving at that event on September 17th, which is going to be the big full fundraiser. They told me, and I agree, I make a lot of historic recipes, most people don't want to drink 
flat, warm ale. <laughs> so although they'll be giving that out to the people, they'll also be giving out like cold lagers. <laughs> you know, things that are more acquainted to the taste of the times. So we have a little bit of history to get that draw into people, and then we have some quality stuff to kind of please them. Bring it back even further to where we are now, though, we've got some really exciting projects. I just received a donation of $20,000 to fund our operations, but also to fund a really special project we're doing with the Mercersburg Academy. Uh, the Academy's been great for us. They've been doing community engagement, restoring our cemetery, but they do this thing called an intensive where for nine days, the students learn one subject and takes away exams. And the engagement teacher asked me, what could we do at CI with their students? And we did some, we planned something which we've been wanting to do for years. Can you live 18th century? For nine days, six students are gonna be dressed in 18th century clothes. They have no technology. They're gonna be living the 18th century at CI. So each day has a theme. Can you cook 18th century? Can you work 18th century? Can you dance 18th century? And at the end of it, they have to do a report on it. And clothing six students, of course, is expensive, which is why that donation came through from one of our very generous donors who's an Academy alumni. And for us, it means after that happens, we now have all those clothes and interpret tools to use for future programs. Uh, I am youngish. Ish is definitely the word there. And a lot of people look to me as a historian and say, kids, they don't care about history. They do. You just got to sell it differently. Uh, history is all the fun of video games in real life. Uh, I'm seeing more and more youth who are booking our school programs and saying, ah, I started a fire on Minecraft with Flint and Steel. Can I do that for real with you? I've been watching this YouTube blog of someone who's making their own blacksmithing tools. Can I do that with you? I follow a cooking show from someone in England. Can I do that with you? The kids do love history. It's just it's not the same book history uh, we kind of we're raised with, and so we're adapting to that and making history engaging for them. And this 18th century program we're doing is definitely part of that. That brings me even closer to where we are right now. You're, of course, all attending the CDBA, CDBA Mixer tonight, for February. March 10th is going to be at CI. CI has been really richly rewarded by our relationship with the greater community. We're not just a small Welsh-run historical society. So I can deal with it. Uh, not a bad <laughs> uh, We're not just a Mercersburg place. We're not even just a PA place. We are advertise and get a lot of visitors from Frederick, Maryland now. Uh, but by working with Chambersburg and Greencastle with the CDBA, we're getting this much larger business network. And so this mixer, March 10th, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. is going to be at CI. And if you have Scotch, Irish, or Welsh heritage here, not many, okay? What was it? Four, I was in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> uh, St. David's Day is March 1st, patron St. Wales. We are, of course, in Welsh run. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, March 17th, I believe, Patriots Day of Ireland. And so our mixer on March 10th, I'll say that again, March 10th, is going to be between two of those, with those cultural days which we celebrate at our site. So we'll be having some meals historically prepared that reflect the Welsh and Irish culture. We'll have drinks available. Uh, Gear Out Brewery are donating a six stool of angelic red ale, which I'm told is about 60 pints. Um, and as a kind of a keynote presentation during the mixer at the halfway point, we'll be doing a presentation on taverns and punch, and then giving punch out to the patrons too. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity to see the site at its best. We're going to have several historic volunteers and staff demonstrating our crafts. You can mix, and it's, it might be cold in March, so wear shoes and a nice warm coat. Uh, you can register on the CBBA's website, you can contact me, and I can put you up for it, but it's pretty cool. And finally, and I said finally, uh, brings me to, again, the reason I'm here today, which is to thank you guys for our grant funding for a project we applied for at the end of last year. We have an operating budget, and we meet that. But when we want to do more, when we want to offer a new program, or we want to build a new building, it's through community-funded projects and grants that allows that to happen. So 
I mentioned it earlier, we are constantly seeking to improve our outdoor resources, updating the information to be relevant. Thank you. Many of the interpretive panels at CI had been updated since the 1990s, and history has changed since the 1990s. The frontiersman of Welsh Run, where we are, was not Daniel Boone dressed in buckskins. It was well-dressed people wearing blue broadcloth coats, leather breeches, two pairs of stockings. I could go on. And so our new panels all use primary source images to explain the history. The Rotary Club funded three of these panels. Um, we're always seeking to get more replaced. And my, uh, my decision was, what panel should I do with this funding? And so I decided to do some of the things we need for the assets we have that aren't being talked about. <coughs> so the first one that Craig held up there was our apples and orchards. What were apples like in the 18th century? How were orchards managed? We have paintings of orchards. We have an incredible wealth of apple trees at CI. We make our own cider, so now people can learn about that. This next one is for our gardens. We have a very large colonial garden that does both produce and herbs. And when we're not around, not only is it limiting to the visitor, it's also be kind of dangerous because we have like medicinal herbs that cause diarrhea or death. <laughs> so the panel explains what various medicinal herbs were used for in the 18th century. It explains how the gardens were run, but it also explains some of those stories we can't tell. There were enslaved people at Rock Hill Farm in the 18th century. For years, that hasn't been touched upon. We are slowly but surely bringing that into our daily story. And in the garden, we grow peppers. Peppers were not eaten by Anglo-Americans in the 18th century, but peppers were often grown on plantations by the slaves because of their own cultural taste for them, but because spicy food is a really good way of hiding the taste of poor rations. So the enslaved people at Rock Hill Farm, Diana, Jane, Jean, and Cog, by growing peppers, is like, it's like, why grow peppers? English people really eat peppers. No. But the slaves here, they would have grown them. So it gives us a footway into a new story. The final panel is less flashy, but because we do have an expanded site now of trails, people are getting lost. So we have a new big site map, and these are all big fiberglass signs. Uh, it explains our trail systems, it explains how you can explore the site yourself or find a staff member. It has a QR code for donations, and at the bottom it thanks the Rotary Club of Change Boat Foundation. It thanks the Frank and <coughs> Fan Department. It thanks donors like you who make these panels and the operations we do possible. That was more than five to ten minutes, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and I could literally talk until the evening uh, beer rush. Uh, I prepared 25 leaflets and event calendars for you, uh, so you could all absolutely take one of those. If you have more questions for me, my email is pretty much everywhere on the internet uh, on those leaflets. I'm happy to give tours of the site. But like I said, if you want a good time to visit and you want there to be a crowd and you want to see everything, come on a Saturday, any Saturday, 10 to 5. Come on March 10th, Thursday, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, it's going to be pretty special. Plus, there'll be free beer and food. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>